Um, I'm honored to be here. I thank the committee, subcommittee for inviting me. Um, I began studying correctional boot camps in 1987, and when I talk about correctional boot camps, I'm including both camps for both juveniles and adults. Um, at that time, I was awarded a uh, grant from the National Institute of Justice, and I've continued to study them since that time. Uh, most recently, the University of Maryland was awarded a grant, and I studied the correctional boot camp for adults in, in Maryland. Um, I have then had the opportunity to visit a large number of these camps to observe activities, to consult with staff, administrators, and juveniles, review ev evaluations, collect data. I have visited programs for males and females, for juveniles and adults, and in federal, state, and local jurisdictions. Um, in do, beginning my research on the boot camps, I began by asking people what they expected to be accomplished by the boot camps. Um, they had many goals, but the primary goal was always, almost always recidivism. So I began studying the recidivism and most recently have done a meta-analysis examining all the studies that we could identify that have examined the outcome of recidivism of boot camps. They compared people that went to the boot camps, juveniles and adults, to people that had some other sentence um, or spent time in a facility or on, in the community. Um, this was a large number of juveniles and adults were included in these studies. Um, the, we only used studies that were considered to be adequate scientifically, so the research was design was strong. If the major goal of boot camps is to reduce recidivism, there is little reason to continue these programs. They do not reduce recidivism. Um, this has been the continual result that I found from my earliest studies to this examination of all the studies that I could find in a meta-analysis. Um, there is no evidence that they successfully reduce recidivism. People do have other goals of the programs, though, and so I've also tried to examine the other goals. One of them was to reduce prison crowding. People expected the programs to reduce prison crowding, partly because they would reduce recidivism, which of course they don't, but also by releasing the offenders and delinquents early if they took part in this rigorous boot camp program. The trouble is that many of the judges decide to send juveniles and adults to the boot camp instead of giving them an alternative community um, treatment. So instead of sending them on to probation, they end up giving them, putting them into a prison, incarcerating them in this boot camps or net widening. The other area that we studied in the boot camps was to look at the environment of the boot camps. We did find some positive results from the boot camps. If we looked at the environments, the juveniles and staff evaluated the program as more positive, the boot camp programs. The trouble is we were comparing them to the traditional facilities of the juveniles where there are large facilities, not small, faci not small programs as they have for the boot camps. Um, the, you also must remember when we study and are allowed in the boot camps, we're allowed in those that are probably less apt to provide, to be abusive and have better trained staff. Um, I have just recently done a review of what works in corrections, looking at a large number of correctional programs, including the boot camps. I identify 284 studies that have adequate research designs, and that's very important because much research in corrections is very poorly done. Um, I can conclude that programs that are based on control, punishment, uh, strict rules, confrontations similar to boot camps or scared straight programs are not effective. 
However, we do have programs that are effective. These are the programs that we refer to as rehabilitation, education, drug courts, drug treatment, cognitive skills programs. We do have programs that reduce recidivism, but boot camps are not something that reduces recidivism. For years, I have said we should consider boot camps because we could put therapy within the camps, but looking at the recent uh, number of deaths and in injuries in this camp, I have changed my mind and I no longer support. I think it is too dangerous to continue with the boot camps. We don't have a justification. Thank you very much, uh, Professor McKenzie. Representative Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. And certainly I want to thank my uh, Congresswoman for inviting me today. Um, I want to cover uh, a couple of points that I kind of took out of my um, testimony. First and foremost, um, I want to make sure that um, it is known that I don't believe in coddling criminals. I do believe in personal responsibility, but I believe that it has to be taught. And I don't think that boot camps um, in any way, shape, or, or form teaches that to our young people. I also think that the best opportunity we have to reduce um, our uh, increase in our corrections systems throughout the United States is by rehabilitating uh, juveniles. Um, I think that we all know that the African American population is overrepresented overrepresented in our correction system for adults as well as juveniles. And so therein lies, I think, the, the comments that there is great concern for African-American children while there is concern for all children. Um, I don't think that there is enough mental health um, programming within the con confines of a boot camp. And largely, um, most of these children that go into boot camps are poor children. Their health has not been monitored over the years. And so they go into a program that primarily focuses on rigorous physical activity. The other issue has to do with it being um, run by sheriff's offices, or, or as it was stated earlier, it's, it's a state-run type of program, which doesn't, in my mind, mean that we shouldn't have national outcry, but we certainly should have standards or should have had because I certainly don't believe in, or support the continuation of boot camps, but there has to be, or there should have been, I'm sorry, a standard of training um, within the facilities so that we did not have the deaths that we have had. And that not only includes the medical component, um, which has been insufficient, but also the personnel who are used to handling adults and not children, and certainly that's what, what those young people are. They are developing children. Um, I think it is far better, we are far better served if we do have programs like multi-systemic therapy, which we um, utilize in, in Florida, and I think they also utilize it in Mississippi, if I'm not mistaken, functional family therapy. Because taking a juvenile into a, a setting that doesn't include um, making sure that the family is treated, if you will, it, it, it doesn't complete the cycle. And so in order to recognize um, reduced recidivism rates, then we need to certainly include the family. And as was mentioned earlier, make sure that there's an educational component, there's employment training component, because we are trying to prepare the, the person, who, this young person who has gotten into trouble, not to go into the correctional system. We're trying to prepare that person to come back and be productive in the community. And boot camps certainly do not do that. Um, in terms of the dollars being spent, being state dollars, if you will, I wrote a note that certainly there are federal uh, dollars that fund uh, juvenile justice programs um, and those dollars that are state dollars may be used as a match to draw down those, those dollars from the Fed. And I, in looking at um, whether or not uh, someone wants to continue boot camps or not recognize a national uh, 
importance of this issue, certainly we shouldn't be using state dollars as match dollars to draw down federal dollars if any of the state dollars are going to be used for boot camps um, as we continue on. Let's see. Um, as I said before, as my time runs out, I think we are far better served and we have far more statistics that show prevention programs work, therapy programs work, wilderness programs even, like um, Outward Bound, where a young person can find out where their strengths and talents lie and then draw on those to take them through, through life. Um, we have a high murder rate going on right now in Jacksonville, and I think uh, it certainly involves a lot of our young people. Um, I think adults as well as, as children could certainly benefit from the inclusion of conflict resolution in any program. And with that, I thank you very much. Thank you, Representative uh, Gibson. Now we'll have um, rounds of questions from uh, members. We limit ourselves two to five minutes, and I'll recognize myself first. Um, Professor McKenzie, just on the question of recidivism, uh, you've indicated on several occasions that, recidivism, that there is no reduction in recidivism compared to at boot camps compared to other facilities. Um, you also have suggested that boot camps, like the sister uh, programs at military schools, are not uh, conducive to assisting teens to make and keep long-term change. Is that accurate? And if so, could you expand on that? Uh, that's accurate for the, the boot camps of, of adjudicated delinquents and offenders. There's no evidence that the overall evidence is that they do not reduce recidivism. They don't change the, uh, the delinquents so that they don't continue in a criminal activity. In terms of safety, uh, have you studied the safety of the boot camps? Um, we've studied the perceived safety of the boot camps from the perspective of juveniles in the camps and staff, and we compared that to traditional facilities and safety. The um, they, juveniles in the boot camps felt they were safer in most areas. I think that reflects the fact that the strict rules keep them from being hurt by other juveniles in the facility. They were, however, uh, more afraid of staff. So there was some fear of staff. Well, Ms. Gibson outlined many people who, many children who've died in uh, boot camps. Is there a difference in the death rate at boot camps as opposed to other facilities? That's really where we need some research. We do not have that research. The other thing is we don't really have a very good handle on how many boot camps are still there because there are state boot camps, but there are also many that are run by um, local jurisdictions. So we need to know where they are and then compare the, the injury and death rates in the camps to the other facilities where these young people would be. Uh, you mentioned local, local government run. What about privately run? And there are also privately run, and usually we, contracted and, with government. And, and we don't know whether or not there's a difference in private or local run facilities in terms of safety? Um, as far as their reported safety, we did not find any differences between the juvenile programs that were run by um, public or private, not for profit. So and, and if there's no difference in um, recidivism, are the boot camps cheaper than the alternatives? The boot camps are only cheaper if the people are released after serving a shorter period of time. Um, and the concern here is net widening. Many of the judges make the decision to send someone into the boot camp instead of an alternative like probation. That makes it much more expensive. So some state systems for adults have used it to reduce their prison population. Uh, New York State in particular, because of the uh, Rockefeller drug laws, have you, has used their boot camp for adults to release people earlier, and they report some savings. But they have an enormous number of people um, that they put through the boot camp in a year, 5,000. Um, in comparison, the small programs run for juveniles are probably not saving any money. Thank, thank you. Uh, Representative Gibson, you serve on the Juvenile Justice Committee, or is that a subcommittee? 
in, in, um, in the State House? Yes. Um, you've gotten rid of all of the state-run boot camps. Uh, what happens to children now that would have been uh, sentenced to a boot camp? They're either um, house arrest, because boot camps in Florida were for nonviolent offenders, mm -hmm. and so they're either house arrest or um, probation, community probation, or detention centers. Have, has anyone ascertained whether or not there's been more or less crime as a result of the um, stop, the, uh, as the closing of the state-run boot camps? Not that I'm aware of. What can be done to make these um, boot camp, well, if we're not having boot camps, what can be made to deal with the safety of the children? Um, Dr. Professor McKenzie, we're still having some boot camps. Is there anything that can be done to enhance the safety? Um, in st have strict requirements about the need for training the staff would be one of the first things. I think that my, from my experience, many of the staff were not well trained to identify stress and physical and mental stress that, that the juveniles face in these boot camps. Um, and I am very worried about how long the staff has training. I mean, it's very short periods of time. They are often given, they participate in some kind of training activity. It's, and they, that just won't give them what they need. Thank you. My time has expired. Uh, Judge Gomert. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, let me just mention uh, our chairman of the committee has stepped out, but uh, was going to address, he had indicated he wanted to hear evidence on both sides. And I can tell you, Mr. Chairman, um, we had tried to get some of the witnesses from programs that I'm aware of in Texas that have had a good deal of success. And uh, since we are not, we're not uh, able to offer their airfare or travel expenses to get here, they didn't have the wherewithal to, to do so. They operate on tighter budgets and uh, uh, just could not make the transition. Plus, you know, they have um, uh, small staffs, and it is difficult when you take somebody out for two days and it's not completely job-related to what they're doing. But I did, but there is evidence out there, and I hope we'll have a chance to um, get some of that additional evidence before the uh, committee. Uh, Dr. McKenzie, you made the statement that, and, and in your written statement, it's in all capitalized letters, boot camps do not reduce recidivism, and you went a step further here, and, and, and in your written statement, you said, I believe the research is clear on this, but you went a step further than that, and, when, and I always understand, and as I do, that testifying falsely here is a crime that, you know, I, and I guess the old judge comes out when somebody makes a statement that is so bold. You went beyond that. You said there is no evidence they reduce recidivism. So I'm, since I'm familiar with some places where they have reduced recidivism, let me just ask you, are you not aware of one single boot camp anywhere in the nation that has actually reduced recidivism. I'm aware of some boot camp studies that have shown a reduction in recidivism. I, I'm talking about one boot camp anywhere in the country that itself reduced recidivism among those who have come through that the, boot camp. The studies study uh, a particular boot camp. So yes, I would know. Uh, I do know of. Offhand, I can't tell you exactly which states, but I can tell you, yes, there were some. And in the testimony, I reported that some did have lower recidivism right. from. And it seems, and you, and you pointed some, this out in the studies, it, it seems like in those that have had uh, some success, uh, there have usually they incorporate more than just a physical regimen. They use the the education and training and, and uh, life skills is not always has not always been terribly helpful but uh, but there is a dimension of that that can be uh, and I wanted to be sure if you were aware of those or not but uh, you also said you were allowed in boot camps that were less apt to be abusive did you make attempts to be in boot camps you knew were more bu boot abusive 
we attempted to go into every juvenile boot camp that was in existence when we started the study of the environments of juvenile boot camps. Is that just in and Florida or all across the country? Across the country. Uh, that's a lot of boot camps. You, you made inquiry point, of every... I, I gave the numbers in here. It was about 48 or 49 okay. um, boot camps at that point that we could identify. Well, and I noticed the uh, most recent study that you cited, uh, I think was um, 2001. Uh, have you reviewed any studies since then that uh, are being cited? Um, re reviewed studies? Well, I, I was just... The recidivism or...? Uh, well, the studies that were cited uh, had the most recent ones. There were a couple of them, I think, that were 2001. Uh, those were the studies that were cited as footnotes to your, for your statement. Did you have any other appendum to your uh, statement of other studies you uh, utilized? The studies in the meta-analysis that we conducted, um, we conducted the meta-analysis two years ago. Okay. That's referenced and My on time is, okay, and, uh, uh, all right, thank you. Um, but I did want to ask Representative Gibson, and thank you for coming. I know it's a hardship for anybody that comes up here, and especially when you sit around for us like this. But I, I, I was concerned. It appears that Florida legislature has taken steps, and you'd made indications of things that concerned you that, that you know, the abuses obviously should require uh, some action. But I just want to ask you, is the Florida legislature incapable of addressing boot camp problems unless the federal government tells you what and how to do? Thank you for your question. Um, I believe that what Florida did was change from a boot camp model to something called STAR Academies. Mm -hmm. um, however, we had no takers um, with the change in the structure um, even though the dollar amount was there, and of course it's it's a shared um, shared program between usually a sheriff's department and the state, um, and the reason we had no takers is because of the training. There's a different kind of training required to to be a sheriff as it is to be um, over juveniles. There's mm -hmm. there are different takedown uh, methods taught and and other. Um, kinds of training that individuals need to have when they work with juveniles. So we had no takers for the program. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. But uh, you feel like Florida could handle and legislate requirements for its own boot camps as really, or did you need the federal government to tell you how to do that? Let me go back to what I, I, I believe I said in my initial comments, and, and if I didn't, I certainly meant to. Um, that I believe that the issue of juvenile justice is a national issue. Um, children are children from state to state, and there needs to be standards put in place nationally so we don't have these kind of issues. Um, and I believe federal, um, na federal is national, um, and I believe there needs to be involvement, and we sh wouldn't be where we are today, I don't think, if we had national standards to deal with our juveniles. Okay. And if we don't pass national standards, Florida, you're saying, would not be able to adequately take care of the boot camp issue within its own state? Florida won't have any boot camps, first okay. of all. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. The, um, I believe the gentlelady from Texas came in next. Do you want, gentlelady from Texas is recognized. I thank the distinguished um, uh, chairman. You know, this is the kind of uh, hearing I'm just grateful that as we have moved uh, to a new 110th Congress and we're working with our colleagues, friends on the other side of the aisle, that we've been able to initiate questions like this. And I want to put firmly on the record my appreciation to Chairman Scott for giving us a very broad roadmap. I chair the Congressional Children's Caucus, and it is holistic in its approach, mentoring programs, health issues such as obesity, gun violence over the years that it's been uh, in place, children exploitation. And so we look at things um, in, a, in a broad manner. 
and certainly we recognize that children have to be disciplined, they have to be rehabilitated. Uh, and when the boot camp first started, maybe a decade ago, and people were excited, and CNN was covering it, and it looked like, and let me bite my tongue, fun, um, good way to discipline children. We didn't know that it was going to become a death trap. Or those who had uh, good intentions didn't know that in places around the country it would result in being a death trap for children. Now, I've just come off the floor discussing the propensity and the epidemic of youth violence. One-on-one, uh, -on, -one, uh, one of the most conspicuous examples, of course, was uh, the four youngsters who broke into the home of Sean Taylor, which resulted in his death. I say that to recognize that we have a uh, dual problem of violence perpetrated by youngsters and then, of course, how do you save their lives, how do you intervene, and how do you uh, work with respect to intervention. But I would like to ask Representative Gibson, and I thank you for your leadership coming from Florida, and I'm not sure if you're from the area, forgive me for missing your testimony, it was on the floor. Um, I only know the story of the youngster who was flat on his back and big hurly burly uh, people stepping on him. Is this Mr. Anderson? Is that the young man? Yes. Help me understand. Um, why we should be questioning uh, boot camps across the country and why it poses a severe problem more so than it solves problems of youth crime, which I assume this young man was in because of some incident, criminal incident, and I assume maybe you're from this area. As I said, forgive me, I came in and I'm looking at some notes, but help us understand. I understand Florida has eliminated the boot camps, Yes. By state action, is it all gone or are they in the process of being eliminated? No, following this uh, Martin Lee Anderson incident, actually the boot camps were closed and the children were moved. And what year was that? 2004, I Four. think. Four, that's okay. Why don't I just let you answer the question and then uh, doctor, would you follow up, professor, would you follow up and tell us if we wanted to overhaul this concept of boot camps? and we wanted to find a fix, and we're looking at a number of legislative initiatives, more intervention, what eliminated totally, or is there another um, model that could be used? Representative Gibson, just tell us about uh, the situation in Florida. Well, and thank you. I think the uh, video speaks for itself and speaks very loudly um, to the fact that folks obviously didn't know how to handle this young man, um, and there was a lack of training. There was a lack of consideration for his physical ability for him to do whatever it was they wanted him to do. And his size compared to their size. Absolutely. Um, and the fact that they stuffed ammonia tablets up his nose. Um, I, I just, it's very egregious to me, and I don't, I don't see how anyone looking at, at that and knowing the, what happened, that they could even think that the boot camp model works. The other part of that, and I think I put in my testimony, is that um, as far as I know, uh, boot camps were military um, in nature designed to prepare people to go to war. Um, we're not preparing our children to go to war. We're preparing them to come out and be productive citizens. And I don't think that the boot camps do that, nor are they um, inclusive, as I said before, I think you arrived, of a deep therapy, mental, their, uh, uh, mental health issues abound um, with our young folks today. Um, we're finding that not only in Florida, but I believe across the United States, that there are myriad of mental health issues that certainly aren't addressed in a short-term boot camp. Um, and the recidivism rate that I think we're after with our taxpayer dollars is not recognized. And the aftercare programs that some of the boot camps have had, the, um, the programs are very fragmented. And so it, there's no help, actually, for the child or the family. Do you have, quickly, Professor, do you have an alternative model, very quickly? Um, alternate would be to really 
use the programs that we know are effective, the treatment programs that include education, focus on drug use and drug education and drug problems, um, like drug courts, uh, with multisystemic therapy is another one that looks very promising. Um, we have programs that cognitive skills would be another one. We have programs that are effective. We might want to try, given that the environments of boot camps, the staff and juveniles did say positive things about them, we might want to try structured, small structured programs mm. without the military basic training model. And the roughness that ensues. And the roughness. Let me thank you, uh, and I yield back. Thank the chairman very much. Thank you. A gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Why is it that um, roughness would not work in terms of uh, discipline, in terms of physical um, requirements? In other words, do the push-ups, do the sit-ups, do the chin-ups, do the laps as part of the disciplinary process, as part of the uh, teaching of respect uh, of authority that uh, sometimes many young men and women are missing um, and which can contribute to them being thrust into the uh, juvenile justice system uh, for a, uh, a rebellious uh, young person who has had no disciplinary uh, guidance, uh, who may not have achieved on a physical level, uh, may never have done a push-up or sit-up, uh, and who basically lacks respect for authority, couldn't boot camp, if properly administered and if, if, if supplemented with, uh, with uh, various uh, psychological training methods and that kind of thing, couldn't it uh, be something that could be positive? Or, or is it, and I'm at this question for both of you all, or is it just the, the whole boot camp model uh, it needs to be uh, just done away with because it has no merit whatsoever? Uh, is that what I hear you all saying? And I'm sorry that I was not here at the beginning of the, uh, of the, um, uh, uh, of your testimony, so I didn't hear. And I'm kind of asking this question uh, out of some skepticism of tidbits of what I've heard just sitting here so far, and also uh, probably a, a lack of uh, knowledge about uh, how to positively impact juveniles who have gone astray. So I'll, I'll listen to your responses. Spare the rod, spoil the child, you know, those kind of things <laughs> that we've heard. Um, you know, talk to me. Let me start by saying this. I'm the mother of, of two sons that I raised by myself. Um, both of them have graduated from college and I didn't spare the rod nor the, nor the mouth. <laughs> um, in terms of physical activity as a way of um, disciplining young people, I, I don't think that it should be used that way. Well, and I, it, and I it may, may not be just to discipline them. It, it may be to give them some discipline and also give them a means of, uh, of achieving something and becoming more physical, that helping with, uh, with the psychosomatic issues. In other words, I can achieve physically, I'm strong, you know, I can commit myself to more positive pursuits as opposed to what got me in trouble in the first place. I, I, can, made, I can become oh. uh, Michael Jordan or somebody because I can achieve physically. I made references earlier um, before you came to successes of wilderness type programs and outward bound programs and there's a, another program in Florida called About Face that's run by our National Guard. And these programs do have a physical component, rope climbing and things of that nature, but they also focus on team building and trust in addition to the physical component, which 
is not present in a boot camp. You get up uh, at, oh, dark 30, I call it, and are immediately subjected to uh, running the track in the heat or just push-ups. And, and that, to me, does not um, instill discipline and doesn't uh, allow a, a child to totally tap into some talents they may find in, in the rope climbing or in the canoeing or, or being out in the wilderness, communing with nature, if you will. Nothing positive about it at all. Getting up early in the morning, being required to do some laps. Um, there, there, as I said before, there does appear to be some positive attitudes in the boot camp towards the staff and um, the staff towards the juveniles. So there, there is something positive. My worry is with these injuries and deaths in the camp that the military putting that basic training model in isn't effective. My research would say that it doesn't have an influence on later criminal activities. It's not criminogenic. Learning to change physically isn't really going to change you to keep you away from a life of crime. You may need consequences for your actions, and that may be beneficial, but we could do many of these things in a different model of a juvenile facility, not using the basic training military model. Thank, thank you very much. Let me just follow up with one, one quick question. The ranking member, uh, Judge Gomert, mentioned some of the aspects of programs that seem to work. That is, when you have a boot camp with just the physical activities, it doesn't seem to work. But when you add in education, some of the psychological services, mental health perhaps, when you have uh, that, particularly the education, that it makes a positive difference. That is also what I've been led to believe. Is that what research shows? Uh, the research in that area is very limited. We don't have enough information, and the programs don't appear to be um, very extensive in, in the boot camps. So the, the research, I would not make a strong statement about whether the boot camps that now exist that have treatment and therapy within the camps have an impact on recidivism. It's questionable at this point, the results of the research. Thank you. Uh, Judge Comer, do you have any other questions? Uh, since we weren't able to get witnesses, uh, people that I'd talk to, if I could just mention a couple of things. For one thing, you know, like uh, my friend Mr. Johnson mentioned, th there are some youth who have a problem it, it, being that they've never had any self-discipline. They've never been taught any discipline. And, and talking to parents, and teachers of those who have uh, had boot camps. And when I say boot camp, apparently there's a little miscommunication because I consider a boot camp not just to have the physical component, but to have these other components where education is a part. And the day boot camps with, with, with which I'm familiar had the um, officers of the boot camp available any time of the day on call, they'd show up and take the child out of the classroom who was being disruptive and talk to them. And had teachers tell me they could not believe the difference in a child who began to learn and start to reach their God-given potential. I've had parents, there was one mother that said she never could get her, her child to go to bed. And one night she got fed up and she called the sergeant major that ran the boot camp, said, my son won't go to bed, said, put him on the line put him on the line, he said, son, go to bed. And the kid went to bed, he said, how'd you do that? He said, well, I don't know, we need to work on this a little bit. So, but we found that uh, many times the parents needed some training as an additional component, because we're talking about youth. And Representative Gibson, uh, I think you alluded to another issue. When you're dealing with youth, training becomes all the more critical, because, and in, in Dr. McKenzie, that you're dealing with uh, a different, t these are not hardened adults, these are still um, moldable children. But uh, uh, Representative Gibson, you mentioned the STAR program, and, and I'm, I, I don't know if it's the same thing, but that's what 
what we were, the boot camps that I looked at in Texas back when I was on the juvenile board, they called themselves STAR programs and they had the additional components. But it just seemed like, as uh, Mr. Johnson, again, sometimes the discipline is needed in order to get their attention. And one problem we ran into, or, or I mean, I've heard from others, they would have kids get so motivated, turn their studies around, and then after graduating high school want to join the military and they would say, well, you've had these problems in your background, so we really don't want you. And, and I hate to see that happen when somebody's turned their lives around. But anyway, I just wanted to, to mention that for the record. I, I've heard some, some great stories of people turned around, but certainly the, uh, the detriment of losing a precious child uh, requires extra training, requires extra accountability and, and monitoring, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to mention these other aspects. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And I'd like to thank our witnesses for their testimony today. Um, members may have additional questions to, uh, to ask. They'll be submitted to you in writing, and we would ask you to forward your answers as promptly as possible so they can be made uh, part of the record. And without objection, the hearing record will remain open for one week for the submission of additional materials. And I assume the gentleman from Texas may have additional statements. At this time, I'd like to introduce for the record a statement from the Thayer Learning Center and one from uh, Representative Hastings and Representative Corrine Brown. Uh, is there any other business to come before the committee? Without objection, the committee stands adjourned.